we'll just admit that we're getting sick and tired of all the things that doesn't have anything to do with racing on an actual track. And Andretti being accepted into Formula One would have been worse how? So we're doing it again in Jeddah, also on a Saturday. And I've got to say that this has been quite surreal having a race on a Saturday. And even now, my calendar is still messed up. Right now, I think it's Wednesday instead of a Tuesday, which is the day of this recording. But then again, you might be watching this on a Wednesday. So what I'm saying right now is completely irrelevant and you probably already clicked off. No, no, please don't. Could you maybe like or subscribe to watch more of my baffling content? The initial impression coming out of Bahrain was that Max Verstappen and Red Bull are once again the absolute beasts and powerhouses that they were when we went to Bahrain last year. But I don't really think that's the case just yet. I'm not ready to completely condemn the 2024 season and just get on with next year. I do feel like two of the three teams that are close enough to be somewhat annoying to the likes of the Milton Keynes team, were slightly hobbled in regards to their overall performance in Bahrain. So I would rather want to see what Ferrari and Mercedes can do. We have not seen their full potential over a full race distance because George Russell being P3 in Bahrain when nobody expected that. I want to see more of that, especially Charles Leclerc not having front brake issues. And what I'm not quite sure I want to see more of is the fact that Helmut Magpie is being really weirdly complimentary about Sergio Perez. He's continuing his charm offensive surrounding the Mexican by being super complimentary and effectively just going along the lines of saying, Well done, Sergio. Max didn't completely pummel you into the dust by finishing 20 seconds ahead of you. Saying, well, Max didn't completely destroy him. What kind of compliment is that? But it's, it's okay. The Magpie, the Magpie is trying. He is really, really trying, and he is making good on the fact that the Verstappen exit clause has him involved. But then, as I was writing the script for this video, news came out about the new circuit that is going to be replacing the Jeddah Corny circuit, a dedicated racing circuit, not another street track. So many people are already going to be liking the circuit. But brace yourselves, it's being designed by the likes of Herm Tilker, as I know, he's been a very controversial designer of tracks lately. But remember, he was involved with the likes of Sepang and some bits and pieces of Kota. So he does put out some good bangers every now and again. And he was assisted by the likes of former racing driver Alex Wurz. He was effectively carrying on the Austrian torch from Gerhard Berger, who incidentally recently had one of his 1995 Ferraris recovered. Granted, it was a hire car or a rental car for the Imola Grand Prix, but hey, it was a nice feel-good story. We really need a lot of feel-good stories around Formula 1 right now. This new track is going to be replacing the Corniche circuit after the 2027 Saudi Grand Prix. The promotional video provided by the racing circuit that is going to be taking place in the upcoming city of Kidia. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm lost for words. It's very reminiscent of the opening feature animation of Wipeout 2048. It very much looks like that, and uh, I'm all here for it because that game is amazing. And my initial impression from the top-down view of the overall track layout, it looks like if the Red Bull ring had had one too many cups of coffee and it was all completely bent out of proportion, and then it was uh, having relations with the likes of Istanbul Park. It's like completely conjoined together in a way that would make David Attenborough blush. I don't hate it, actually. It looks pretty impressive. And then one of its other big unique selling points is that it has a 20-story high elevation anti-clockwise corner. But then you think, well, that's just Kota. That's exactly the same as that. But then you go and look at the video and one of its taglines, get ready for the first speed track that hugs the sky. Well, golly gee there, mister. You don't, don't give me the vipers. I mean, those kind of marketing gimmicks, I'm all here for. Then you look at that promotional video and you see what they mean by it, hugging the sky. Is that those corners look like it came out of Mario Kart in that it's being supported by beams above the ground. And you got light tunnels, you got amusement things going around like you get at Abu Dhabi and then Suzuka to some extent. It's a very impressive looking track and I hope it's pulled off well because if we're going to be getting more tracks outside of Europe and also easing the pain of Spa and Zandvoort, but my overall first impressions in this brand new track that will replace the Jeddah Corniche circuit are pretty good. Yes, of course, I know it's still in Saudi Arabia and there are plenty of questions surrounding that country, but right now, this is a really good find and thankfully it's not another street circuit because we're getting far too many of those. And I think Formula One's listening to what the audience is saying in that the new Madrid circuit is semi-permanent and then this one is going to be a permanent track. So, okay, we're seeing probably a slowdown on new street circuits. Hopefully what we've got is going to be enough. 
And also, I hope that when we get there for 2028 Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, they have built the track and it's been approved with many days to spare, instead of what we got in 2021, when they were still building the circuit when the FIA were doing their homologation checks. Seriously, it was down to the wire whether or not it would actually take place. Now, speaking of races, are we going to be seeing yet another Red Bull cakewalk? Well, as I alluded to earlier, I don't think so. I get the feeling that if we see Ferrari and Mercedes back up to full speed and getting over their reliability quirks, Ferrari in the case of front brake issues, and Mercedes basically getting their cooling solutions absolutely wrong and that compromised their overall power output, I feel like they might be a little bit closer and that Sergio Perez may not be guaranteed to be propping up a Red Bull 1-2 and he might not get as many glowing comments from Helmut Magpie. But I do feel like this is something that could be genuinely captivating, that Red Bull might only win by, say, 10 seconds, perhaps. I want to see more of the W15 at its full potential because in free practice in Bahrain, it looked really impressive. And you can tell that Lewis Hamilton was genuinely disappointed that that practice performance did not translate to the race. But at least there was a viable reason that in theory can be fixed. And Toto has promised that it can be fixed. It's not an inherent concept problem. It was just they got their numbers wrong with their measurements. And then with Ferrari, it's located to the front brakes. There are clear problems that can be fixed quickly. Granted, it's only a week, but at least we know what it is instead of Ferrari just going, well, we, we don't know why. And Mercedes going, well, well, we don't know why. So at least they know why. And then you've got McLaren because Carlos Sainz, one of the dark horses of Bahrain, has actually been rating McLaren as one of the sleeper sensations of the circuit and that they might be trouble and right up there with them because last year they were really good at the high speed sections, most notably Maggots, Beckett's and Chapel, where Lewis Hamilton could not keep up with Lando at all and it looked remarkably good. And we see plenty of those little sections at the Corniche circuit. So I do think McLaren will be close though. And I hope that Lando is in contention for a podium, but I don't think it's going to be any more than P3 at most. And also it depends on whether or not McLaren can qualify well. The MCL 60 of last year, when it was a bit of a lemon, Oscar Piastri was able to get into Q3 and got eighth in qualifying, which was remarkably good. That was impressive. And that was with the car when it wasn't amazing. So imagine the MCL 38 having its best opening gambit for McLaren in three years. I'm quite curious to see what might happen. I do expect McLaren in Q3. And if one of them pulls a blinder, then they could be in contention for a top five finish. But in terms of the podium, I really don't see anyone outside of the top four teams really being a serious contender. So sorry, Fernando, at least for now. But then you might be aware about all the stuff that's going on in the background concerning the likes of what happened in Jeddah last year with Fernando, where he had P3, then it got removed, he got a 10 second penalty, and then it got reinstated again. Well, there might have been something to it regarding the likes of Ben Suliam, once again, the FIA director, getting into a bit of hot water. I think he managed to go two or three months without doing so after the prize giving debacle and all of that awkward tension at that ceremony. Now it turns out that he might have been involved in attempting to try and change the result of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix by alluding to the idea of expecting that the original result would have been reinstated and that we would have then had the wondrous idea of Fernando Alonso getting a second podium in a row, that magical narrative tale in the wake of Red Bull getting a 1-2 and looking like it was going to be a cakewalk for them, and that that Fernando podium in Bahrain wasn't a fluke, and that this was going to be de rigueur, Aston Martin being P2, and there being a really good feel-good story. We don't know for sure the exact reasonings as to why this might have been the case, or whether or not it even happened, but this investigation is ongoing. It's going to be about four to six weeks, but right now, this is exactly what the FIA and Formula One management did not need. Once again, proving that all of the hubbub surrounding the drama about these organizations which provide Formula One to us are showing that things are just looking incredibly messy. And then it lends even more credence about Red Bull and Max Verstappen. Verstappen being fed up about what's going on in the background with his team. He just wants to get on and race. Of course, we all are glad to have had that podium reinstated for Fernando, but if this had something to do with it, then that's incredibly shady. And then you just feel bad for the people involved and for Fernando as well, that he was a pawn in this kind of chicanery. Then again, all of the stuff with Red Bull is just absolutely ridiculous. And really just the racing side of it is the only bit that seems to be just having any sort of solidity. The last time I recall a major team sort of eating itself whole from within is the whole Spygate situation of 2007. The disillusioned Nigel Stepney passing classified information to people at McLaren with the main people at McLaren not having any idea about it. And then they get fined $100 million and they get stripped 
of their constructors points. That's the last time I remember any sort of discord within a dominant team that Ferrari had been in the 2000s and then there was a major decline as people started to fritter away away from all of the chaos and then obviously a natural decline. That's the last time I think I see something similar. So in a way you got to give kudos to Mercedes in the sense that we didn't really get any sort of those kind of dramas at the time when Mercedes were dominant. Apart from the Nico Rosberg drama in 2016, which of course was resolved when Rosberg decided to retire, you then go, okay, that was relatively stable. Well, I mean, up until 2021, obviously. But then at the same time, you look to the bottom half of the grid and you're really not quite sure. The problem with all of that is, is that the top five teams, that's Red Bull all the way down to Aston Martin, they are pretty much looking like they're going to be locking out the majority of the points. It's going to be really difficult for anyone below the likes of Aston Martin to be guaranteed points that you can go, yes, they are definitely going to score. But then you get the feeling that the likes of Zhou Guan Yu and one of the Hasses might get a point or two and be a little bit cheeky if Aston Martin are looking like the No Man's Land team right now. I want to see more. That Zhou Guan Yu put in a really mature performance in the wake of this being his potential last year in Formula 1 and that his tenure at Sauber was on a knife edge. This was a really good opening statement for him and I want to see what he can do at the Corny circuit. And the Haas situation. They seemingly are getting a grasp of their tyre management situation after five years of having that being a problem. And I just feel like I want to see more about this idea of them maybe not being the holders of the wooden spoon in terms of Formula One teams and maybe being on the lower end of the midfield, which is where they have been the last couple of years, being around that P8. I want to see more of that because quite frankly, Alpine are looking like the wooden spoon holders right now, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of light at the end of the tunnel for them. But with Haas, there is a plan at least. And I want to see what Nico Hülkenberg can do when he doesn't get himself tangled in a turn one incident, because he qualified in Q3 again with a car that is objectively far off the pace with everybody else. I want to see what Haas can do. I'm intrigued, especially with another track that is really abrasive on its tyres. That is something I'm going to find fascinating if Haas can pull out a Q3 feature once again. Williams, well, it's really hard to say because the car looked okay in Bahrain, but the main issue with it was that it did have teething troubles with its steering wheel, being the Formula One equivalent of Argos in doing shopping differently from anybody else. They then get a situation where that steering wheel was causing problems. For Albon, it was for the fact that the vibrations meant that he could barely see what was on his screen. And then with Logan Sargent, the steering wheel had a little bit of a wobbly and then it led to the brake balance suddenly jamming itself and that caused him to spear off at the corner of turn four or turn one and therefore that compromised his race entirely ended up last and about two laps down. It was not a skill issue. It was down to the fact that the steering wheel computer said no. And I feel like Logan has unfinished business because last year he looked impressive in qualifying in Jeddah. Had he not had a track limits issue in his only second race in Formula One, he might have been in Q2 in his first opening gambit and probably been a bit of a talking point alongside Oscar Piastri getting into Q3. That would have been really impressive. So I feel like Logan, he might get a Q2 appearance and maybe topping up near the edge of Q3, maybe like 12th or 13th. Points, I don't think so for Williams, but I'm hopeful that they'll get over the teething troubles of that new steering wheel because that did compromise their overall race for both drivers. And Alpine, I mean, what more is there left to say about them? They have a car which is 10 kilos overweight, reportedly. Over 10 kilos, in fact. And this is a track where you need to be agile. It's high speed and medium speed corners. You can't have a lolloping whale going around the track. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see once again the Alpines of Ocon and Gasly 19th and 20th. That does not surprise me. But... There seems to be some sort of movement going on that for once there is a plan basically copying McLaren if they're having a three-tier model of somebody in charge of engineering, performance and aero. This is something that does take a lot of time though. This isn't going to be something that fixes the problem instantly and it may not work because I recall McLaren had this situation before back in the day when they were in their dark age period and that didn't guarantee results. They went back to that model and it does now seem to work because there are other things attached to it. Just because you have three different representatives doesn't guarantee that it's going to work wholesale. They basically looked at McLaren and saw their upgrade path and went, yeah, let's do that then. But it's not a guarantee, but at least there's a plan instead of just hiring somebody and then going, oh, we don't 
have a replacement. But anyway, let's get on to the predictions. So once again, I do feel like it's going to be a Max Verstappen victory. You can't dismiss this guy at all. The RB20 and him are absolutely one with one another. It would be absolutely ridiculous to question that otherwise because there haven't been any other meaningful upgrades since we were in Bahrain last week. So I really don't see anything different aside from a reliability failure. But then again, the Red Bull car has been bulletproof, especially throughout 2023. I don't recall the last time there was a mechanical issue aside from the beginning of 2022, those first three races. I think the last DNF that Max had that was mechanical was in Australia 2022. And then Charles Leclerc will be following along in second because had he not had that front brake issue, we might have seen Charles Leclerc way ahead of Checo and we then would have seen potentially him getting within to 10 to 15 seconds of max because that car, the SF24, is geared towards Charles Leclerc. And that brake issue is something very important where there are lots of heavy braking and turn 10 at Bahrain is infamous for being a bit of a tire killer if your brakes aren't set up properly. And that lends me to Checo. I don't think he will be in the top five because Ferrari, Mercedes and McLaren might really be on it and be flexing their muscles. And I feel like the person in third will be Lando. There are a lot of high speed corners here and in Silverstone, he was a beast. I'm really keen to see what we can have for Lando Norris in being able to almost effectively double the tally of points that they had in Bahrain. Maybe Piastri being in the top 10 as well, about maybe seventh or eighth, but Lando is going to be on it. This car is looking like something he is quite happy about. And we've seen in previous years where Lando Norris has a solid start, a really good one, this lends to him having a really great season overall. He really does need a solid start to be able to prosper later on. So I do think he's pegged in third. And then I'm going to go for a little bit of a punt with Lewis Hamilton in fourth place. No George, I hear you say? Well, I feel like that once we get over that race pace setup issue, Lewis Hamilton will have the potential to be able to maximize the car that was built for him. I do feel like Bahrain was a little bit of a blot on his overall 2024 campaign but I feel that might be addressed once they get some little problems tweaked and modified for the second race. And that means Lewis might be a little bit more on it, considering that the last time he got a Grand Prix win was here in Jeddah in 2021. So I do think he is quite good here. So I do think that he will be in the top five and then Carlos Sainz will be finishing off the top five. I do think that it'll probably be that combination and that Checo might be having to deal with P6 because again, if the Ferrari Mercedes cars were working at full performance potential, then Checo may not have been second place. He might have been lucky to be on the podium. And then we might be starting to see more comments from Helmut Magpie that aren't quite as complimentary to Checo. But don't get me wrong, I want Checo to do well. I want him to have a solid season. But based on what we saw in Bahrain, it's not a done deal that we are going to see loads of one twos, but at least we had a one two for Checo. So but that's something. That is something. But then let me tell you about all of the stuff that happened with Max and Mercedes. That was absolutely crazy that that is even being discussed and Toto Wolf being a little bit of a scamp and not completely dismissing it yet. Keeping their options open and you can see my overall bewilderment and astonishment in this video here that you might have missed that I put out yesterday a bit later. It's a bit of a doozy, I can tell you that. 